from the beautiful Rivard Plaza in downtown Detroit. This is Detroit Unspun TV. My name is Dave Langholm and I will be your tour guide for the next half hour of stories about the transformation happening here in metropolitan Detroit. This week we've got a lot in store for you including a feature about how one guy is celebrating National Bike Month and Detroit Voices this week gets out to Macomb County to follow a particular ballet. So sit down, Put away the mouse and enjoy the next half hour of Detroit Unspun TV. In headlines this week, Karen Dibus had the chance to take a friend of hers from Atlanta on a tour of the Motor City. And while their journey shattered many of her friends' preconceived notions about Detroit, it also led Karen to discover that maybe we as Detroiters could be a little bit more inviting to our visitors. Paquette Square opened almost two years ago as an effort by Southwest Solutions to help our nation's military veterans that reside in metropolitan Detroit. John Van Camp, president of Southwest Solutions, shared with us why his agency decided to start serving this population and the role he sees Paquette Square playing in the future for our veterans. And did you know that Detroit is home to one of our country's preeminent research facilities concerning infant mortality? Terry Sullivan shed some light on what researchers are learning from this partnership involving Wayne State University and the Detroit Medical Center's Hudson Hospital. Now, to stay on top of stories like these about Detroit's transformation, be sure to check out our blog. It's at blog.thedetroithub.com. Now, the month of May is National Biking Month, and there's one Metro Detroiter who's doing everything he can to make sure he gets everywhere on two wheels. Here's his story. If you offered me a car today for free, there is no way that I would be able to take it. Um, between taxes and gas and insurance and registration and maintenance costs, owning a car makes absolutely no financial sense. It's, it's more trouble than it's worth. I had a car and had no job, uh, and once I sold my car, I found a job downtown. I think because you think when you, when your options, when your scope is limited, it allows you to concentrate more fully. So you're, you're looking at every place in the surrounding five miles rather than thinking, well, I should try out in Waterford, or let's go up to Pontiac. Maybe they have jobs. You just look around you, and you see a lot more opportunities than you knew were there. Uh, my favorite thing is being able to connect with your surroundings a little bit more. You know, when you're in a car, it's, uh, it's like you're watching the city go by on a TV screen. When you're on a bike, you move a little bit slower, you hear the birds, you can say hi to your neighbors, and you connect with your community more. Uh, well, the challenges, I think, the two biggest challenges are distance and weather. Um, the bike limits your, the distance you can go in a reasonable amount of time, uh, so I don't make it out to the suburbs very often. I don't go to the east side very often, living here in Midtown. Um, but, you know, it, it does allow you to explore the thing close to you a lot more, which is nice. Um, and then weather, just, you know, through the winter, e even though we had a relatively mild winter this winter, um, it, when it starts to snow really hard, it makes the biking a little bit more arduous. Uh, but again, you know, it's just a, a good excuse for uh, to work a little bit harder, for a little bit more exercise. <laughs> there is a great, um, the old Moose Lodge, it's an abandoned Moose Lodge uh, on Grand River, and I think Elizabeth has a great um, painted billboard for Levi's jeans painted onto the side of it. It's faded, it's orange and white. It must have been full color at one time. Um, is at least 40 years old, if not older. Um, would have never noticed it. But the fact that I'm only going 15, 20 miles an hour and I'm able to look around the city at me, I notice this and it's really cool looking. And that's something that I never would have seen in a car because the, the roof is there so you can't see the tops of buildings because you're paying attention, you know, and rightly so, paying attention to the traffic around you. But being on a bike affords you a chance to look around a lot more. When I bring, when I have friends come and visit me from out of town, um, I have a spare bike and I take them on biking tours of downtown and midtown to be like, hey, check out all this cool stuff. Here's a chance where we can see it. We can get everywhere we need to go. We can see it 
and we can still keep carry on a conversation um, all at the same time, which you would not be able to get in a car. Uh, well, you know, food shopping is, play, it comes down to a lot of thinking ahead and planning your meals. Uh, if I know that I'm going to have chicken, rice, and veggies on Tuesday, and I'm coming, you know, just biking past the grocery store, I might as well stop and pick up some veggies on my way instead of getting, you know, going on Saturday and getting a giant shopping done. What I would like to see is for more bike lanes to be put in the major thoroughfares of the city, um, up Grand River, for example, all the way down Cass. Um, Cass might not be a good example, it's a little bit narrow, but certainly Trumbull. It stops halfway up Trumbull. Like, why? It, it, it misses this entire neighborhood where tons of cyclists live. Um, to, to connect the city a little bit more, I think we, we need to kind of expand it. Even, even a little bit would be nice, you know? I would just kind of urge more people to bike around the city, um, like I mentioned before, as a way to connect with the city, as a way to you know, get yourself moving and become a little bit healthier. Um, and as a way to, you know, meet up with friends. There's lots and lots of, uh, you know, bicycle groups. There's, there's Bikes and Murder, there's Critical Mass, there's, there's all these groups of people that meet just to have fun riding bikes. And, and it's a and it's, it's really nice way to, to meet new people. Tech Town is home to a new nonprofit focused on helping adults with GEDs get the work experience they need to join the workforce. It's a way to pay it forward, if you will. Here's the story behind the effort. So everyone has heard of the pay it forward concept. This young gentleman, Charlie Cavell, 21 years old, just graduating from Wayne State University, has taken this concept and make it, made it into a formal initiative called the Pay It Forward Initiative. Charlie, and this is one of his counselors in the program, Amy, with us today. Thank you guys for taking some time. Yeah. Charlie, tell us about a little bit about your story and how you got started with Pay It Forward oh, yeah. Initiative. Well, um, Pay It Forward started back in September 2010, um, and what we do is we employ, educate, and empower young adults in Detroit who don't have opportunity. So, um, the like right now we have a current cohort of 15 interns, so five of them live in shelters, six of them have children of their own and are single parents, and also 12 out of those 15 aged out of foster care as wards of the state, not being adopted out. Um, so needless to say, there's a big need there. So what we do is we connect those people that have those deep needs without connections. We bring them together with businesses and nonprofit partners who sign a legal document saying they intend to hire these people at the end of our four-month internship program. So once they do that, then when they start working, and then Amy comes in, and also our two other counselors, Andrea and Steve, they come in. And they meet with each of our interns every week and make sure that they get the services and coordinate the, the things that they need to make sure that they can be as successful as people in their quality of life and improving that and achieving the goals that they have set out. So that's how we educate and empower them through our classes and through the counseling that they receive every week. Amazing. Amy, tell us a little bit about your role. Um, well, as one of the counselors, I actually work directly with six of our 15 interns, and I meet with them, as Charlie said, on a weekly basis. We started out uh, with original meetings where each individual put together a an, an, an personalized goal plan uh, where they get to determine where they would like to be at the end of the 16-week process and how they would like to get there. And then at our weekly check-ins, we kind of see how they're making that progress and what they're going to be focused on in the immediate future and in the longer term future so that they can get from where they are today to where they would like to be. So do the interns have to have a basic education level already? What And what are the parameters? How do you even get these interns involved? Well, the funny thing is, is that we have a, we have, right, it's required that you have at least a GED or high school diploma. Um, but the funny thing is, is that uh, because the people that we work with, right, they've gone through a lot of blips in their life, right? They go through a summer job program and there's a blip up. And then they go down because there's no more summer jobs. Or they go up through a blip through a temp job or an internship or some random thing. And this is supposed to not be a blip on their radar. This is supposed to be, they've gone through this sort of thing in their life talking about their careers and just jobs and money, right? They've gone through this, and the pay it forward is supposed to be this, and then take off like that. That's the goal, right? So it's not just a temporary internship, um, but what our interns have learned from all these blips that they've run through is that uh, 
it's best if you don't have a GED or if you do have a criminal record or if you do have three children and you say you have two, right? Those things that you learn from that, oh, people don't want to hear all that. So what um, we've run into is that we had these requirements, but actually a couple of our interns, well, one uh, is actually, uh, fortunately, he's getting his GED and we, uh, we had to allocate some money so that he could go to like the little ceremony and stuff or whatever. But, um, but we, you know, once we found out that he needed to get his GED, we went, oh, well, you know, you're part of the family now, so all right, you should have told us, but cool. Let's, let's make let's it happen. Get you there. Right, right. So, Amy, do you have an actual story, a success story that you can reference with this program? Um, well, I can tell you there are small successes all along the way. So, a number of my interns have had a number of things that they haven't been able to do before. So, I can tell you, I work with an intern, Sheila, who one of her biggest uh, goals right now is to own a car, and she's never been able to save money before, and she has now been able to develop for herself a detailed budget and to save some money, and she has plans to buy a car from one of her coworkers. Um, and she's delighted. She's delighted not only at the prospect of her independence, but she's also delighted. Um, it was kind of funny, the first time she ever said the word coworker, she lit up because she had never had a job before and she felel so accomplished. So there are definitely the uh, the day to day success stories. Um, I know one of Steve's, um, Charlie had mentioned two of our other counselors, Andrea and Steve, one of Steve's interns, um, Ayana has actually gotten hired where she was working for her internship. Normally we the plan was for her to work the 16 week internship and then if it worked out she would be hired and they were so dazzled by her and she was so interested in working for them that they said, "Well, let's hire you right now." And actually gave up the free help, quote unquote, that they were getting because they wanted to retain her so quickly. Right. And that's an amazing success story. And to go also deeper into that that Ayana, she's got two children under the age of five. And what Steve has helped coordinate as the counselor with Pay It Forward is we've gotten grant money, right? We get money to pay the interns. We've connected her with a job. We've gotten her to set up arrangements to move out of the shelter she's with with her two children. And her two children are getting set up to work, uh, to get enrolled at a Head Start, so kindergarten, basically. Um, so that, right, it's not a blip, it's a, so yeah. Consistency. Good stuff, yeah. This is an extraordinary program. Can you tell some of our viewers or businesses out there that might be watching how they can get involved and maybe help you succeed oh, with your mission? Always, yeah. We're always looking for more business partners that have more openings to give people jobs. Um, and we're always, of course, naturally looking for more money like everyone. <laughs> you guys have a website people can visit to yeah, learn more about it? PIFDetroit.org. P-I-F Detroit.org. So pay it forward, P-I-F. Wonderful, guys. This is uh, a, a tremendous program. I'm excited to see the progress in these young individuals in our community making that pay it forward difference. Please check out their website, see if you can suggest it to someone who needs it, or perhaps donate and see if you can pay it forward too. This is Natalia Petrzak reporting from Tech Town on Wayne State University, Detroit. Back to you, Dave. The Detroit Grand Prix revs its engines in a couple of weeks, just a few miles from us on Belle Isle, but they've already started a unique partnership with the Detroit Public Schools to give school children a chance to learn science on the racetrack. Here's the story from the students at Youth Neighborhood News. elementary students in Detroit sang about racing as part of the Grow Up Great Grand Prix program kickoff. The Grand Prix is much more than a race. It is an educational opportunity for kids. 600 kids will attend the race on Bell Out, not for a field trip, but for a learning trip. The kids will combine math, science, and fun into a learning experience about engineering and racing. The Chevrolet Detroit Bell Out Grand Prix, in partnership with the PNC Bank, is hosting the mathematics and science programs for Detroit Public Schools. We are excited that you chose Emerson School to announce the Grand Prix DPS and PCN Grow Up Great Partnership, which includes the fifth gear program, A World in Motion. We are extremely excited that our fifth grade World in Motion students will have the opportunity, not only have the opportunity to learn how to build a car, but through this new partnership, they will have the opportunity to expand their science and technology experiences by studying the car from a racing standpoint.
which will give them broad experiences in, in car building and its operations and functions. Both the new fifth gear program for DPS fifth graders and the Grow Up Great program for pre-kindergarten students are providing hundreds of DPS youths with a foundation in science, technology, engineering, and math through hands-on activities that build on what they, they're learning in the classroom. I know the importance of this firsthand. I ran engineering for Cadillac, manufacturing for Cadillac, and several other plants. You really need to know math and technology. More than $300,000 of improvements are being made on Bell Isle for the race. The goal is to have a race at Bell Isle every year. But the Grand Prix is much more than a race in Detroit. Um, the Grand Prix is about bringing confidence to our community, uh, showcasing our city to millions of people. Millions of people, boys and girls, are going to watch this race on TV around the world. Uh, it's about bringing economic development to our and benefit to our region. The last time we had a race here in 2008, we brought over $55 million, that's a lot of money, to our area. According to recent news reports, Southeast Michigan has the nation's highest concentration of technology engineers outside of Silicon Valley. But we have 76,000 engineering jobs that are not yet filled. This program has been created to encourage us, today's students, to pursue careers in engineering. Um, funded by a grant from the PNC Foundation, Fifth Gear really combines mathematics and science with, I promise you this, kids, fun. And that's really when learning takes place, when it's done in a great environment, and I'm sure this program is going to match that requirement. I am Kendall Levant. And I'm Morgan Levant. For, for YNN Logan, Logan Network, where we bring you the younger side of the news. Do you have a home improvement project that you're going to be tackling this weekend? Well, why don't you ditch the big box store and head over to Habitat for Humanity's newest ReStore, where you can get some really good stuff at really good prices and help our community while you're at it. Natalia gives us this look at their latest location. Many people are familiar with Habitat for Humanity as it provides affordable housing in our communities. But they have another option as well, it's called ReStores, where people can come in and buy affordable things to improve their homes as well. So I am with Tara and Reggie, and they help facilitate the Detroit-based, the newest ReStore in the area. Yeah. Tara, tell us about the ReStores. Yeah, they have been around uh, for Detroit for about 10 years. We just opened our third location here on Mack Avenue. and. Um, as you said, it is a great resource for low-income individuals, and actually everyone now with the economy being the way it is. It's a great resource to come in and either find things to repair your home, enhance your home. 70% um, of our items are gently used, 10% are, or 30 percent are new. So I know you guys got shots of our paint, carpet squares, things like that are brand new. So a lot of landlords use us to enhance their homes, and Reggie can sort of talk about what other products we we have. You never know what's going to come in. Mm -hmm. So, um, pretty much anything that you want to uh, improve your home, you can get it from here um, at cheap, reasonable prices. Like some, like some of our doors range from eleven dollars and fifty cent. It might cost you sixty-two dollars at Home Depot or Lowe's. You can get it here for eleven dollars and fifty cents. So, and the proceeds from that goes to building our habitat homes. So it's a win-win situation win -win for everybody. Situation. Now, is anyone eligible to buy the products and services here? Yes, it's open to the general public, so anyone is welcome to come in. We have this location, which is at Mac and Cadu. Um, we have our 96, 96 in Greenfield's mm -hmm. location, and then in Pontiac. Do you know those cross streets, Reggie? That's the Osmond. Yeah. Osmond. It's on Osmond Road. Yeah, in Pontiac. So, yeah, it's open to anyone. Okay, so I understand you also have something called a deconstruction service. Can yes. someone speak to that? Well, we do have a deconstruction crew where they go into your home, like you remodeling your kitchen or bathroom. We will go into the house and we'll disassemble it for sale. We'll bring it back to the restore. They will receive a tax uh, donation form for the items that we receive. And it's a fee, but it's a small fee. Cheaper than going to a contract. 
Excellent. So I, like you were saying, you mentioned this, the proceeds then that you make from this store go right back into your program right. to building new homes. Tara, can you, can you speak sure. to that? Yeah, like Reggie said, deconstruction is wonderful for us. It's a really minimal fee. We come in, we take everything out, and the best part is we salvage as much as we can and we sell it here. So like Reggie said, toilets, doors, anything we can sell. So the homeowner's happy, they are able to do their home improvement project. We sell those items at a discounted price and then all that money goes back into building homes. So we do about 20 new homes a year for Habitat in Detroit. Um, we rehab homes, so it's just a great win-win for us because it's unrestricted revenue source for Habitat Detroit. So how do you think our viewers might be able to participate or help in this yeah. project? There are two ways. They can definitely come in and shop. That's a great, easy way. And then the second way would be to donate. Um, we're always looking for donations. Like Reggie said, we take anything that can be used in a home. So furniture, um, as you walk around, you can see. But anything that can be used in either home improvement or home beautification, we accept. Okay, and then my final question is really, a lot of people might be intimidated with starting projects in their home. So are you guys available to give them some advice and tips? Well, when they're doing a new project? Well, from my knowledge of some of the things I have done as far as working on a deconstruction crew, if they have a question, I will answer it to the best of my ability. Um, and if not, I can recommend them to somebody who can give them, you know, more knowledge about what they're doing. Excellent. And, and so is there a website or, or a place that people can go to learn more about this? Of course. Um, Reggie, you can give them the Restore website. Okay. It's, it's www.habitatdetroit.org. Um, and then um, we have www.metroresource.org as well. So Metro Resource will take you right to the Restore uh, page. And then Habitat Detroit, if anyone wants to learn about being a homeowner or any of our volunteering, we always are looking for volunteers to help us build. You can volunteer at the Restore. We always need people to stock shelves, help Reggie with all kinds of things. Um, so this is another option if people aren't interested in construction, they can help us here. So Excellent. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Okay, guys, so Habitat for Humanity doing a lot more than meets the eye. Come check out one of their restores when you have an opportunity, buy some home goods, and also support the community. This is Natalia Petrozuk reporting from Detroit. It's a nonprofit ballet company for kids ages 8 all the way up to 25. And we do two full-length performances throughout the year. We do the Nutcracker every year in December, and then we do another ballet. You know, this year we're doing the Wizard of Oz. But we're housed at the McComb Center for the Performing Arts. And it's open to anybody from any county, any dance studio, anywhere. I feel like this company makes a difference in the, their lives, in the kids' lives. And I feel like it makes a difference in the community because we're being, you know, we're able to bring the arts to the to a community where it's not there's not a lot of it you know it's not like New York City or you know it's just a small company but I feel like we reach out to a lot of people and we sell really well our show sell you know like our Nutcracker sells out and so that's really nice yeah, yeah everything's all classical ballet we do some like we've done one that was like a contemporary and that was like 10 years ago but everything is classical I think it's more moving I think um, it's the foundation of all dance, and I think the music has a lot to do with how it moves you. You know, like hip-hop and jazz music, it's more upbeat, and it's fun and everything, and it, it just makes people feel a different way than a classical or piano piece of music would. And I think the fact that they're kids doing what they do is very impressive, you know, to, to, like, for them to be so young and to be able to do what they do. It's impressive. They are dedicated and disciplined. I mean, we practice. They have to take three ballet classes a week, three technique classes, and then most of them rehearse twice a week. So right there, you've got five classes, and most of them, I mean, some of these kids take 10 classes a week. We usually do, um, we typically try to go to a nursing home or a hospital. We've done that before. We perform yearly at the Festival of the Senses. That's in um, Clinton Township. Um, we, do, we do that. We've done... Um, We've performed at fundraiser stuff. We've done um, all sorts of stuff like that. We've gone to schools. We've gone to um, we've gone to schools that were not in the greatest of areas and trying to reach out to those kids. And it, you know, we like I went myself and another director, and we brought some of the dancers and just tried to teach them a little bit about ballet. And then we um, paid for them to come to a performance. 
Um, in a lot of ways we reach out by giving people tickets. Like we almost always give tickets to turning point. It's like for, um, like abused wives and children, they almost always come. So we try to do as much as we can in that regard. It should be a very exciting show. There's a lot. It's the Wizard of Oz and it's based on the book, not the movie. The costumes are amazing. They're amazing. I'm really excited about the costumes and the sets and the props. I think it'll be really exciting. A lot of colors, and it's a story that everybody can relate to. Everybody knows the story of The Wizard of Oz. Everybody loves it. But the kids really love it, and we're having a good time with it. And it's just, it's just so fun and colorful and playful. So it should be a really good show. Well, that does it for another episode of Detroit Unspun TV. We hope it's been an informative half hour for you. And as always, thanks to Jeremiah, to Natalia, and to Ashley for all the hard work behind the, behind the scenes to put this show together. And of course, to you, the viewer, for tuning in each and every week. Buena suerte, Detroit.